stereo. Certainly sounds like a herald to me. Could be a herald for uh, any one of a number of different purposes, perhaps all of these purposes. That was a ram's horn. That was a uh, shofar. It is the instrument for which teruah was named by Yahweh. Teruah means to shout out a warning and to uh, express the good news. The sound of that instrument is the human breath, which is nephesh in Hebrew, meaning soul, also breath, being blown through a ram's horn, um, exiting as air, which is ruach in Hebrew, which is also the name for spirit. So what starts off as a nephesh comes out as a ruach, through this instrument called a ram's horn, that which is mortal becomes immortal. As a result of using this implement, this ram's horn. But of course there's more to it than that. The ram's horn is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. If you want to go from mortal to immortal, it is essential that you begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and move through all 22, understanding the meaning of each of them and understanding, closely examining, carefully considering the meaning that they provide to each of the thousands of Hebrew words Yahweh shares with us through his witness, his restoring testimony called his Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. They are all written using these 22 letters of which the ram's horn, this instrument, by which the mortal soul is transformed into the immortal spirit, is the first of these letters. And it's not just the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, not just the first letter of now the English alphabet, not just the first letter of what became the Greek alphabet, or even the Latin alphabet. It's the very letter that was combined with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet to conceive the word alphabet, Aleph and Beath. When Aleph and Beath are combined, you have the ram's horn and the home, the home of the protector ram, the home of the sacrificial lamb. That would be the covenant. It's the first word in every Hebrew lexicon. It is Yahweh's first choice of titles. It means father. As you consider the ram's horn, the teruah, consider also that the most prevalent title for Yahweh, Almighty God, is also comprised with this ram's horn, the LF. It's comprised of this very instrument, which is the signal of Teruah. It combined with the Lamed, which is a shepherd's staff, also associated with the ram, leading sheep, becomes Almighty God. The ram is protective. A ram will defend his flock. The ram will not tolerate a rival. The ram will make certain that any animal, for example, the wolf that Yahweh warns us about, warns Christians about, although they paid no heed to him, but the ram is prepared, able, and willing to defend his flock against the wolf, against Pauline Christianity. Yes, the ram's horn this shofar, the instrument for which Teruah is named, conveys an enormous amount to us if we are observant, if we closely examine and carefully consider what Yahweh has to say. Now, why did Scott blow the shofar today? Well, the reason is tonight, at sundown, is the beginning of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. It is a month that began in 
uh, or year that began in Abib. Abib is the first sign of a renewing moon, a Kodesh, from the verb Kadash, which means to renew. But the first renewal of light on the moon surface, which is the, the timekeeper for God and man, it's the only way that man throughout the ages has been correctly, been able to correctly assess uh, months and years based upon uh, the um, a, a universal system. That that Kadesh, which became Kodesh, meaning month, from Kadesh, meaning renewal, speaks of light growing, reflected light growing on the surface of the moon. It is symbolic of of our lives being renewed and of the illumination that we have from Yahweh growing, us growing in enlightenment, us growing in all dimensions as a result of Yahweh's plan. And this now is the seventh month. As I say, the first month is Abib. Abib is a very important time. It's amazing that, that so few people understand what these words mean and what they are conveying to us. But Abib uh, speaks of young barley ears, still green and growing, receptive. And it's the time, so we're looking for a new moon, a renewal of the light on the moon's surface to be more accurate, at a time that barley, which is always synonymous with saved souls, that barley is growing in the fields, still growing, still receptive, still green. A time where barley, which as I say is, a, is Yahweh's symbol for saved souls, with the chaff being synonymous with that which is blown away, discarded, ceasing to exist. But it's a time on the first month of the year when we are still receptive. Early in our lives, we're receptive to what Yahweh has to say and still able to grow and to receive his message. And so it is on that first month from a God who is one. On the 14th day of that month that we begin this passageway to God, it is a passageway that begins with a doorway, a gateway to life, Pesach. The next day, prepares us for life in Yahweh's presence, which means that we need, need to be perfected. It is matzah. Matzah de-yees our souls, takes the fungus of sin, of religious and political rebellion, away, so that we are prepared to enter Yahweh's presence, appearing perfect in his eyes. This enables Yahweh on the third day. The This would now be the 15th and 16th days of the first month to adopt us into his family. This is Bukhutim, firstborn children. That leads to seven sevens later, seven being Yahweh's favorite number. It speaks of man in addition to God, six plus one equaling God's idea of perfection, the reason that God created the universe in the first place. For us to be together, six plus one, six in addition to one man with God, equals seven. On the fourth of these seven invitations to meet with God, it's called Shabuah. It's about seven sevens. It's the promise of the Shabbat. And Yahweh is therefore calling out to us on this day, his children, those who have availed themselves of Pesach, Matz, and Bakudim, are to draw together with all who will listen and receive Yahweh's enrichment and empowerment so that we on this day, Teruah, can become effective messengers. And it is our opportunity as his covenant children, enriched and empowered by him on Shavuah, adopted into his family on Bukurim, perfected on Matzah, made immortal on Pesach, to share this good news, that God, the creator of the universe, has created a path to him. And also a warning that God hates religion, and that all religious paths actually lead away from him. 
and that those who are religious will die. If they are the victims of religion, they will not know hell, they will not know heaven. But that there are those who are the perpetrators of religion, and this is the warning of Teruah, that if you promote religion, if you promote politics as the answer, if you are active in the military, then your soul will spend eternity separated from God. And there's a warning in those words. So that is what Teruah represents. That is why we blow the shofar. It is a sign from God's family, from his covenant children, that there is a way home, that our Father has introduced himself to us and is inviting us to become part of his family, to be immortal, perfected, adopted, empowered, enriched, and even his troubadours. Isn't that amazing? The creator God of the universe wants to work with us, wants to share his message through us. And so on this day, we're empowered to share that message. It is uh, this opportunity, therefore, because Teruah begins tonight at sundown, that we will uh, share a Shabbaton. So here it is, now the seventh month, the seventh renewal. A very important time because everything God conveys is based on seven. And it's the first day of this month that God, who is one, would like to work one-on-one -on -one with us as we share his message. That on this time of renewal, that we tell the world that we're on the cusp of the end of the world as we know it. It has but a few more years, and then everything is going to change. During that last segment, I was tardy on picking up a, uh, a phone call, but the, uh, the caller from Texas uh, had a question. I think that Scott answered his immediate question, but for those that, it was Anthony, for those that are, uh, are interested uh, in buying uh, Yada Yah, which is where I'm going to be sharing uh, the insights on Teruwa, or the Introduction to God. Uh, in fact, uh, while I'm speaking of the Introduction to God, uh, the host of the Louis Free show, Louis Free, uh, is currently reading uh, an Introduction to God. I will be on his show for two hours tomorrow morning from uh, 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow morning uh, with, uh, with Louis for those who are interested. Um, Brain Fruit from the Heartland is the name of his show, Louis Free. Uh, you can Google either Louis Free or uh, Brain Fruit from the Heartland. And if you're um, so inclined, please uh, call into the, uh, the show. It's always interesting uh, having a conversation with, uh, uh, with Louis. Louis is uh, a Jew by race. Um, he is not uh, religious, uh, however, which is a good thing. Um, but... Uh, the book that he is currently reading is an intro to God. I'm sure we'll talk about that during the uh, the show. But uh, for those who want a, a printed copy of, of an introduction to God, of Yada Yah, which means to know Yahweh, or Questioning Paul, um, they are all available um, at claritors.com. They're unbelievably cheap. Uh, I don't make a nickel on them. I'm not trying to sell anything. We try to make them available as cheaply as possible, which means that um, nothing comes to uh, to me um, as the author of these books. But claritors.com, you'll find yada yada, intro to God, and questioning Paul. You can uh, search the site under my name, Craig Wynn, and they will all come up. And if you put in uh, yada15, you'll get a 15% discount on your uh, your purchase. Now, returning to Peru, it is the first day of the seventh month. Now, in Yahweh's um, uh, way of timekeeping, a day does not start at midnight. A day does not start, at, which is what we do today. A day does not start at um, uh, dawn when the sun rises. In Hebrew, the day starts when the sun sets, and it ends at sundown. And you might wonder, why in the world would Yahweh establish a day like that, beginning at, uh, at sunset? And I'm going to give you what I think is the reason. He doesn't tell us the reason. I mean, it's his choice. I mean, why, why did he choose 
uh, seven is the formula for everything that's important to him. Why did he establish his calendar based on seven? Why is there six plus one day a Shabbat uh, during the week? And why are there seven invitations to meet with him? He based everything on seven, and I have my opinions as to why he did that. Uh, my, I'm not even sure they're opinions as much as they are reasoned conclusions based upon what he shared. But uh, uh, you know, Yahweh, yeah, throughout his testimony, provides us with a lot of insight. So the reason I think, and this is an austere thing, that the Hebrew day begins at sunset and continues through sundown the following day, is that he both wanted to set the example for us as the diminished manifestation of himself as Yahusha, as Yahweh was saving us. On the Pesach, to enjoy the Pesach meal with his disciples just as he has designed that meal to be enjoyed by us on the, the sun sets on the 14th day, which would be the 13th day at sunset, and goes through the 14th day of that month, he wanted us to understand the importance of and to see a perfect example of someone who was Torah observant enjoying the Pesach meal with his friends. But he also had an extraordinarily important responsibility. He had promised to be the sacrificial Passover lamb. Now, the only way that he could enjoy the Pesach meal with his disciples on Pesach, Passover, and still be the Passover lamb on Pesach, on Passover, is for the day to begin at sundown and to continue through sundown. So it was a Thursday night of that year when on Thursday... He um, celebrated Pesach with his disciples, and the word disciple, every time I use it, I just kind of get choked on it for a, uh, a moment. I know that what it conveys, but um, unfortunately, it is a transliteration of a Greek word, uh, and Yosha did not speak Greek, and he did not give his, uh, his, those he had chosen to witness his life and his words a Greek title. Uh, but the, the Greek word means learners, those who learn. And the Hebrew word for learn is yara, is the basis of Torah. So that's something significant to know. It is a wind instrument made of a ram's horn. And you were to think about the reason that it was being blown at this time. Who asked for it to be blown? And to think of what it represents. Would you blow it off? Would you think about what it, uh, it might mean that maybe, maybe, just maybe, that since he asked us to do it on this day, that he chose this instrument, that the creator of the universe is trying to tell us something? Do you think that there's a possibility that there's something more to it than the haunting and resonating sound? Do you think that when today, this is the first time I'd ever put these thoughts together, but it's uh, resonated with me that 
we take a deep breath. And breath in Hebrew is nephesh, soul. All souls are mortal. And with our mortal soul, we choose this instrument that Yahweh has selected for us, and we blow through it. And what comes out is equivalent to wind, which is ruach in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for spirit. And through this instrument, we are transformed from mortal to immortal, from death to life. And that the very instrument that we're blowing is a ram's horn, which is the very implement that on Pesach enables this transition that makes those of us who are mortal and flawed such that we are perfected in Yahweh's eyes and the doorway to immortality is open for us based upon the sacrifice of the sacrificial lamb. Kirk, does any of that resonate with you? Absolutely. You know, I was uh, I was just sitting here thinking, you know, that's the yeah, that ram horn is absolutely the vehicle to uh, turn us into uh, spirit. Yes. That's brilliant. I mean, that's really brilliant. It's probably why he wants us to shimmer this stuff, huh? Oh, absolutely. You know, and 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 what the thing that I liked about uh, your uh, your observation there is that um, you are, and it's very important for our listeners to know this. You weren't calling me brilliant because I didn't come up with the idea. Yeah, we chose the implement. Oh, yeah. It was just—it was just a matter of of us thinking, you know, scratching our head and saying, "Why did he choose this implement? And what what is the implement all about?" And that's the the obvious reason that he chose the implement. Wow. Yeah, he's you know all of his you know, his metaphors, his symbols are extraordinary in this way. That's why I took the time to go through a beeb and what it means, and the first month of the year, and the uh, month and renewal of uh, of light on the moon's surface, and what to seven. This is the seventh month and the first day of the seventh month. What all of those things represent, because when we shamar, then all of those things resonate with us. We're literally listening to the creator of the universe enlighten us. You took some time to uh, to examine the letters that comprise Teruah, this day that we're uh, celebrating. Let me share the introduction of the concept of Teruah with our listeners, and I want you to, if you wouldn't mind, uh, share the basis of Teruah considering those letters, because um, after all, the ram's horn, isn't that the first of 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet? At the very beginning. Yep. So it says, Ba. N and with ha, D, it's a definite article. Seventh, seventh is uh, uh, Shabi, um, it's from Shaba, which means a sworn oath and seven. The, the Yahweh's promise is based on seven. So in the seventh month, Kodesh, based on Kadash, uh, which means time of renewal, on the first, the Echad, and each hand is not just first, it's the one. It's the the one and only. Uh, of the renewed moon, Kodesh again, time of renewal. There exists, there was, there is and there will be from Haya, the verb that defines Yahweh's name. For Yaal, to speak um, southern, Yaal. and it's yeah, La Atem, which means for you to approach a Shabbaton. A Shabbaton means that this is a day to be treated as if it were a Shabbat, even though it it doesn't necessarily fall on the seventh day of the week, but it is to be treated in all other respects as if it were a Shabbat, a time of rest and reflection on God's promises. The memorial sign and mental reminder of an inheritance rite, whoa, a zikaron, from Zakar. Uh, this is, is something that is to remind us. It's a sign that we can read to know where we are and where we should be going of an inheritance right, which is what the covenant is all about. And the first point, yeah. And the next word is teruah, which Yahweh then defines as a cleansing and set apart kodesh, mikra, invitation to meet and to be called out for the purpose of reading and reciting his testimony. 
Teruah. So, what does Teruah mean, Kirk? Well, the uh, Teruah is to signal alarm, of course, and to shout for joy. So mm -hmm. we have two two things uh, that sound a little conflicting because you don't use the shout for joy without warnings, but the time being as it's designated, this is uh, the end times. This is the mm -hmm. call for to let you know that we're running out of time, and that should be obvious to everyone. And, uh, all right. Everyone I talk to, they they know this on some gut level. Well, well, for example, you know, we're shutting out the uh, a an alarm that uh, Yah was returning, mm -hmm. and uh, we're also shutting out, and, and which is really good news. And we're also sending out a warning that if you are not reconciled in your relationship with him by way of, of his Torah guidance, you're not going to be uh, very happy upon his return. No. So it's, it's both warning and, and happy days are here again. So, right. Uh, so uh, it it's also can be a um, battle cry. Mm -hmm. Can we refer to trumpet. Uh, right. Rejoice! By the way, there is a battle coming, aren't there? Two of them. There's a, two major worst things that uh, have ever hit this earth. That uh, well, people will want it. Yeah, and on uh, both of these two battles, the uh, the ultimate uh, force that prevails is Yahweh. Yeah. So he's actually engaging. See, he doesn't very often engage in battle. The last time we saw Yahweh like, engage in battle, like, he gave some some uh, battle instructions. Uh, for example, with Jericho, just march around it and uh, and blow the horn, uh, and blow the horn, uh, <laughs> and that was sufficient. Um, but uh, the last time we actually saw him engage in battle is when he defeated the Egyptian uh, military. He drowned them all. Mm -hmm. So um, this time he will, and I'm going to use the same force, I think, force of water, but, but uh, he, um, he is the means that, that the Muslims who have uh, flooded into Yisrael in the Battle of Magog, he's the one that stops them. Mm -hmm. Because the, I mean, Israel is incapable of stopping them. Yeah. So he stops them, and then uh, in Armageddon, is when he returns and he obliterates anyone who was in opposition to him and to his people. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that it, it's not so much that he obliterates, it's, it's absolutely nothing to protect you. You know, you just right. melt in his presence. That's, That's what correct. I was, uh, much, yeah. uh, uh, That's correct. You know, he didn't have to kill you. You just chose the wrong side and you have no protection now. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, when, you're, when a human soul dies, you almost not killing that soul. No, they just die. They just die. They just cease to. They just cease to exist. Right. Yeah. You didn't want me, so why should I want, I want you? Want you? Right. Yeah. I'm not going to give you the means to live eternally with me, and I certainly am not going to punish you. So uh, uh, you just simply cease to exist, and that's true of of his return. Those who are in opposition to him just uh, are um, obliterated by his very presence. His his energy. His light is so enormous that if you don't share that same light, if you don't reflect that same light, if you aren't, uh, haven't been perfected by that light, you just immediately cease to exist. And by the way, you know, even, even in the case of uh, eliminating the Egyptian army, mm -hmm. the Yahweh yeah, didn't go after the Egyptian army. He was no, not he the aggressor. He didn't use any weapon of war. Mm. All he did is he held the waters back for his children he stopped holding the waters back when his children had reached safety. Yeah. So really, it was it was Yahweh doing nothing that eliminated them. He didn't he didn't strike a blow. Their own demise. Yeah. They, he held the water back, protected his children. But when his children were were safe, the, the purpose wasn't to drown the Egyptian army. It's just that he had nothing to do with them, and so there was no reason for him to protect them. He just simply. Let the waters return to where they had been. So yeah, it's the uh, this Probably is a cruel guy, huh? It's right, it shows. Right, you know, it's it's also interesting that um, if you go back to the previous time that Yahweh used water, this would be during the uh, the flood, um, during Noah's uh, time. Did um, Yahweh have to engage to create the flood? No. No, he didn't. No, no, in fact, it was a uh, the the timing was the uh, Burkle uh, crater. Now we don't know what Yahweh called the uh, the uh, asteroid that uh, or meteorite that hit the Earth, but uh, it left a um, a scar on beneath the sea 
uh, not far from um, uh, the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates River that is uh, is still, I think, 30 miles in diameter, a uh, 1,000 feet or more beneath the ocean surface, an enormous impact crater. And it was that impact that uh, that created the tsunami that rushed through up all where, where humans lived within the Selma, up the Tigris and Euphrates River, up through the Black Sea, which is where the first civilizations were, and then uh, out even in through the Bosphorus Straits into the Mediterranean. And it was the upwelling of, of seawater, which Yahweh predicted. He said it would be deep seawater that would cause the flood. But it's the debris that it kicked up that, that caused then it to rain for the 40 days and 40 nights. He just didn't protect humanity. He protected his family, however. So it is interesting, uh, Kirk, that in the flood, Yahweh didn't kill anyone. He protected his family. Um, and he protected his family in an interesting way. He didn't um, uh, simply uh, wrap a bubble around them or put them in the palm of his hand. He, he gave them instructions and say, if you will follow these instructions and do as I have uh, in, um, outlined here, if you follow my guidance, you'll be protected from what's coming. So he knew what was coming, but he chose to protect eight people if they would listen to what he had to say. And the rest didn't receive his protection, and they um, they ceased to exist. It's the same, isn't it, with the covenant? But, but also Noah did warn these people. Yes, he did. I mean, he it, wasn't like, it. it wasn't like he kept it to himself and said, "Well, I'm I'm out of here, and you guys are uh, toast." Yeah, Teruah. Yeah, Teruah. Uh, exactly. And I'm sitting yeah. here looking at the uh, letters, mm -hmm. and um, all of a sudden I realized, you know, that Teruah is made up of five, the fifth mixer. It's made up of five letters. Oh. This, guy, this guy's good, isn't he? He is good, yeah. He is good. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the fifth Nick, right? Uh, and by the way, the, there's four of them that are fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And uh, those four, the first four that have been fulfilled, uh, were they um, fulfilled in a, uh, in a particularly important time? Is there another four involved in their fulfillment? A very specific time in the fourth uh, in the fourth. Uh, the light comes in the fourth year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was said in the yeah in the creation account that on the fourth day, the fourth uh, thousandth year period, and that the greater the light will come years. as a moed, as a sign of the meetings. And, and, and so he, he fulfilled the first four in year four thousand yah, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's pretty good with his timing. Yeah, he's, uh, he's he leaves clues everywhere. He sure does. He sure does. So, um, what do you find on the uh, on the fifth well, micro, okay, other letters. than it has five letters. Yeah, what is what does it mean? Well, you've got you you, you start off with a toe, uh, tall, and the uh, tall, of course, is a a T sound, a T mm -hmm. letter, and it's a signature. It's an upright pole. Mm -hmm. It's a signpost along the way. Uh, Zion would be mm -hmm. a good example of that. So I mean, he starts out with telling you what what this is all about. Um, Second letter is a roche, or we use it as an R sound. It's the head. It's a man or a woman observing with their eyes, testing with their ears, mm -hmm. engaging with their mouth. It also mm -hmm. means top and first, like in first fruits, mm -hmm. because it is a harvest as well uh, as uh, first fruits. Mm -hmm. um, Wa, of course, is the tent peg and used to enlarge the family, the family home, like they would within the tent days of the tent. Mm -hmm. The A, the Ayin, or the A, uh, is a I, watching. Uh, observant. Observing, yes. Uh, Proper perspective, uh, understanding. Perspective is a key word there because that's what he really asks us to do is to change our uh, perspective on things and to, uh, to uh, follow him. Right. And if the only way to change your perspective relative no. to him is to use your eyes to read his Torah. Right. Yeah. So, and then you, of course, you have the hay, and the hay is a person standing up with their hands raised, beholding something magnificent. So, um, uh, with the eight sound, so we have Toroa. It's, right. Uh, now, now I, I took the liberty of a couple of interesting notes I had on there. In addition to that, you have the T, which is a, can also be a gift, mm -hmm. an upright pole, which is Edon, the upright pole. It can get a greater gift than that. All right. The upright pole both represents, uh, well, it primarily represents Pesach, 
because uh, the blood of the sacrificial lamb was put was was uh, smeared on the upright pillars of the doorway to life, just as on the fulfillment of Pesach, uh, the blood of the sacrificial lamb, Yosha, was uh, smeared on the upright uh, pole that became the doorway to life. It's interesting, by the way, there are uh, three of the letters in Yosha appear in uh, Teruah. The Ain, the He, and the Wa are all letters that appear in uh, Yosha's uh, name, um, having uh, this also point to Yahweh. The only two letters that don't are the the Yahweh signature and the observant individual. Um, the T and the, so the last three point to Yosha, uh, with the first two pointing to the observant individual will notice Yahweh's signature on this particular day. Well said. The, uh, um, well, we can now uh, go to commercial, so mm-hmm. we'll uh, break down. I've got a few okay. other little interesting notes on there you might find interesting. Okay. Teru is a marvelous term, and we're going to examine it more closely to see what Yahweh had in store for us on this day. It's an invitation that he has provided to us for us to meet with him and to read and recite his testimony on this day so that we can be called out. They have.